Hi. So our first question today is how did you come to write this week? Um, it's actually a very simple story. Uh, it was a friend who asked me a question. I had an accident, a bike accident, much like Tia has in the novel, and I hit my head and I lost 20 minutes of my, mem of my memory. And when I sort of came to, when I started creating memories again, I was being pulled into an ambulance. And my first question that I remember asking was, where is my friend that I was cycling with? And a moment later he said, I'm in the front seat, I'm here. But afterwards he said, what if you'd asked for me and I wasn't there? And that's all that it took for me to start writing this, um, this novel, just that what if question, like Stephen King asks us, asks us to do. What if such and such? What if someone we loved disappeared? What if that someone we loved uh, maybe never existed in the first place? Maybe there was no record of her. What if? And that's really how it started. Pacific is the name of Tia's, possibly imaginary girlfriend, possibly not. I was just wondering how you chose her name. Uh, that was just um, luck, good luck. I was spending time with a friend in Calgary, Canada, which is the city where I'm from, and we were just off uh, the main drag in the inner city called 17th Avenue, which is restaurants and bars and cafes. We were just resting in the sun, and we encountered these two young men, um, one of whom was wearing an Argyle sweater, and his name was Pacifique, and I just thought, I had never encountered that name before and I thought it was so beautiful. So later when I was trying to come up with a name for my possibly imaginary lover, Tia's possibly imaginary lover, I thought I can't just give her a regular name. It needs to be something special, it needs, needs to be something rare. And also I wanted something that, something that evoked the setting um, because the book is set in Victoria, BC, Canada, which is on the Pacific Ocean. And so I thought Pacifique was just perfect, it had mystery and sort of a bit of an exotic flavor to it and it was just a beautiful name and then my props to my publishing company because they decided to leave the title I thought they might want a title in English um, but they like Pacifique so I think it's great because she's such a central character without really being a character uh, in the novel um, just talking about cause it's set in Canada and um, Victoria, like how important do you think place is in your novel? Place is hugely important for the novel. It couldn't have been the way that it was anywhere else, I don't think. So for one, one of the main settings is the mental institution, the psych ward. And that, um, that place is so necessary if you're going to be talking about institutionalization and psychiatrization, so having that space is really uh, important to a story about that. And the way that it sort of make the, makes the story, like being enclosed, um, having doctor's appointments and nursing appointments, um, eating together in a group, having sort of mass-produced food, like all of those things in that place create um, part of the story of being psychiatrized. And then Victoria as a setting, as a city, um, I just needed a place that had a certain kind of weather, like cold enough for snow, but not too cold, not so cold that you couldn't go cycling in the winter. A place with water and fog and um, mysterious bays and beaches. And so it it happened to be when I had my own accident that that inspired me to write this novel. I was living in Victoria, but it seems to me that this story couldn't really happen anywhere else. It had to be had to be Victoria. Yeah. So, I really like this when I was looking up your novel. The Good Breeds blurb describes it as Girl Interrupted meets Rebecca. And how accurate do you think that is? Well, if it's accurate, then it's very complimentary because if it's I like <laughs> either of those books, then I have succeeded wonderfully. Um, it's definitely like Girl Interrupted in the sense that it's a madness narrative like Susanna Kaysen's book is in that it's a work of madness written by someone who's experienced madness or psychiatrization. So they're both madness narratives in that way. Um, as for Rebecca, we have this mysterious or central female character who, um, who just sort of lives within the, she's in the shadow um, and she's um, and it's a mystery, and it's all, and it's kind of dark, and we don't know if she, you know maybe she's good for good or maybe she's for 
she's for um, evil. I don't know if there's anyone would think there's evil in Pacifique, but there's definitely that play of like, is this is this a good kind of mysterious romance, or is there something maybe nefarious at play? Um, and so I like I like those two playing off each other because it what it's not just an asylum novel. Um, it's also a mystery, and it's also about love, and about how love leaves traces um, and leaves um, shadows on people. Thinking about like Girl Interrupted, because it's a story told from she's telling her past story. It's she's um, Suzanne is much more of a reliable narrator. Mm. I was wondering if you think do you think Tia is a reliable narrator, or do you think she changes from unreliable to reliable? What were you? I actually went and looked this up because it's been a long time since I was in an English class. And what is an unreliable narrator? And honestly, I I don't think Tia is an unreliable unreliable narrator at all. I don't think Andrew is an unreliable narrator at all. I think they are 100% reliable narrators of their own experience and their own realities. And so it's really it's the it's the reader's task or job or responsibility, if they choose to accept it, um, to decide what they're willing to accept. Um, do they take on what Andrew says as fact or as a version of events, or do they choose Tia's version of events, or do they choose maybe the doctor's version of events, or the family members or friends' versions of events? Um, but every version of events, in my opinion, um, for Tia and Andrew, for sure, are real versions of events. So they are, in fact, reliable narrators, even if their stories aren't the same, even if they contradict each other. Um, so talking about Tia and Andrew, the book does switch between their perspectives. Um, if you just want to tell us um, like, why you chose to do that. Yeah, so most of the reason that I had Tia and Andrew as my um, narrators was be was out of pure selfishness. It was fun. It was fun to write the book that way. Um, but also because I wanted to write a, um, a truer story of madness. And in doing so, I needed to have more perspectives than just Tia. I needed to get inside the head of another mad person and have that person tell their story. So it was just fundamental to the, the, the foundation of this book that it's meant to be um, a mad people's story. Uh, so that's why I needed at least two voices and then hopefully by bringing in other patients um, and other characters we get a little bit um, a little bit more as far as like filling out those filling out those stories and filling out those um, understandings of, of madness. One thing that struck me when I was reading it was that the writing style really changes. Um, like it's really lyrical and beautiful when you when Tia's with Pacific, but then it becomes quite quite mundane almost when she's with Andrew. And I was wondering um, why you chose to do that. Yeah, um, again, it was kind of a, a sense of having fun. I had a lot of fun with the Pacific section. Um, I mean, I had fun writing the entire thing, but a real sort of yeah, lyrical, sensual kind of fun writing um, Pacifique and Tia. So that's a fresh, brand new romance um, that lasts only five days. It's intense. It, everything is, is overblown and colorful and hot. And that, was, that needed to be that way to, in order to capture their romance. I also wanted to give the queer same-sex relationships some color and some real verve um, and it might have been slightly you know maybe a little bit too political to make the straight relationship in the book kind of dull but that is definitely something that that is is happening there where I I'm, I'm maybe making a commentary on on you know, straight relationships in, in fiction versus queer relationships um, but also, um, Tia and Andrew have a long-term relationship, and so with any relationship, um, things change over time. And so the, um, the change in tone 
was meant to suggest that their relationship has deepened and evolved, but it's also maybe gotten a bit, a bit more sedate as time has gone on. So, just switching topics a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you're currently working on your PhD. Yeah. Um, I'm Janet Frame, and obviously you both write about mental health treatment institutionalization, and just broadly, like, how do you think her her works have influenced you? Um. Her works themselves have influenced me in that I have been granted the incredible privilege to read them um, and the Faces in the Water changed has changed my life. It's such a fantastic piece of work. Um, as for writing, I think I take more inspiration from her, uh, the way that she would write, which was with quite fearlessly and with great confidence. She would sit down and she would draft things quite quickly um, and she wouldn't do many revisions. She was very, um, she was quite averse to, re to doing revisions and she, um, when she was finished something, she'd often say something like, oh, it's no good, I'm gonna burn it, I'm never gonna send it to you. She would talk to her friends or her publishers or her agents and say, I'm not sending it to you. And they'd have to cajole a manuscript out of her. And it was always, great, the manuscript was always great, um, and then then she'd go back and she'd be writing another one and she'd be committed to it um, in that time, and the insecurity only happened once she'd finished, there was something with the finished product that made her feel insecure, but that confidence in the writing is something that I've tried to take on for myself um, with my new project, I'm just, I'm thinking, you know what, it can be done, you can write, uh, you can write well in a first draft, you can you can commit yourself to a book early on. It doesn't have to be this sort of hard slog all the time. There can be, like my my um, um, supervisor at the university, Damian Wilkins, the writer, he says, there can be joy in writing. And I think that a lot of, um, a lot of Janet Frame's writing was written with joy. Yeah. Just also, like, how did you come, being Canadian from Canada, come to New Zealand and end up writing a PhD on, you know, one of our, um, one of our best, most famous authors? Yeah. So, um, the PhD journey started several years ago. It was the sort of general idea I'd like to do a PhD in creative writing, and then I started looking seriously. And once I started looking seriously, there was only one program that really stood out, and that was the program at the International Institute of Modern Letters at Teherangawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. I saw that program and I was like, this is exactly what I want to do, and plus I get to move to New Zealand. Uh, kind of like a dream come true. And so I started communicating with Damien Wilkins, um, the program director and well-known New Zealand author, and I said, I'm look interested in this program, and we got you know, back and forth, and he said, oh, Janet Frame, do you know Janet Frame? And I had known Janet Frame, but had forgotten that I knew her, and then read Faces in the Water um, after Damien mentioned her, and was just blown away. It's just, it's, it's, I, it took me two weeks to read because it's so, it's so hard to read as somebody who's been institutionalized. It's just this, like, it's, it's, it's horrifying, it, but it's also very beautiful. And I, um, I read it and I was like, this, I have to study the woman who wrote this book. Um, and so with con in conversation with Damien, we came up with some ideas and I put my, together my research proposal and I applied and they let me in. Uh, so that was how I wound up here, um, accepted for the PhD and right before the pandemic, which was good luck. Yeah. So, in your PhD bio, it says that your research is informed by MAD studies. I just wonder if you could give us a really brief description of what that is and how it's influenced specific. So, MAD studies is a field of scholarship, um, theory, and activism that considers the lived experience of those who have received um, mental health labels, who are labeled mentally ill, who have experienced the psychiatric system, who um, go go by um, um, survivors or ex-patients, people like me, um, and it studies their culture and their histories from that perspective. So it's influenced by um, 
things like critical disability studies and queer studies. Uh, the term MAD studies came out of um, a conference in Canada in 2008. Um, it was coined by Richard Ingram. And um, the way that it influences Pacifique is that it basically is the foundation for Pacifique, that this is a madness narrative, a work of madness written by someone who has experienced madness. So it's, it's doing, it's not, it's not just a novel, it's hopefully also a piece of literary activism speaking for patients from the patient's perspective. So. so, in addition to Janet Frame, what other authors have been a big influence on you, do you think? Uh, well, anybody else who has written a madness narrative, so of course we mentioned Susanna Kaysen, we got Elizabeth Wurtzel of Prozac Nation, um, Claire Allen who wrote Poppy Shakespeare, um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, The Yellow Wallpaper, Sylvia Plath, um, but also um, local authors like Pip Adam and um, Charlotte Simmons, who's a poet, and also a poet, Tusiada Avia. Um, that would be a short list of, yeah, some of my influences for sure. What would your books recommend to someone yeah. interested in MAD studies or um, stories of mental illness and psychiatric treatment? Yeah, so if you can find any of the, any madness narrative, so something written firsthand by someone who's experienced psychiatry or mental health challenges, um, read their work rather than say the work of like a family member who's written about it or a staff member at a hospital or something. That's what I recommend people find the, the first person accounts. Um, and then as far as mad studies goes, there's a textbook, it doesn't sound very fun, but there's actually a very accessible textbook called Mad Matters, um, which is available at the uh, university library. And freely available on the internet is the um, International Mad Studies Journal, which just started, so its inaugural issue is online for free. And um, Asylum Magazine is also an excellent resource for yeah writing by psychiatric survivors about um, topics that touch on MAD studies and its activism and its scholarship. And just to wrap everything up, I was wondering, what are you working on next? Uh, I'm working on my PhD at the university and there I'm writing a second madness narrative. It's called Reunion Island and it's about Savannah, who is a teenager who finds love and obsession one Wellington summer. Um, and I'm meant to be finished a draft within about a month, so it's going pretty well. Awesome.